you've hit a plateau. Inquire all those questions you've always wanted to know. Ask Katie anything. Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of Ask Katie Anything. Um, today's podcast, it's very exciting you guys. It's sponsored by our very own Jessica Victoria and the Stay Strong Collective. She is an author, mental health advocate, and anxiety coach. She offers very affordable anxiety coaching services. And her book, So I Said to My Anxiety, is available for pre-order now. So I Said to My Anxiety is a personal guide to managing anxious thoughts. The book explores anxious thought patterns in relation to school, work, performance, interpersonal skills, health, LGBTQ plus issues, and much, much more. It also catalogs typical anxious thoughts, countering them with more rational, self-soothing ones. Accompanied by powerful illustrations, Jessica's helpful tips come from her personal experience with anxiety. She understands that anxious thoughts are sometimes rooted in reality, and still, her message is clear, it will be okay. To learn more about her services or to pre-order her book now, it comes out late next month, go to staystrongcollective.org. Thanks, Jessica. That's awesome. One of our own community members sponsoring a podcast. Super, super cool. Um, so yeah, I today I've been writing more about, uh, I'm still writing in my book, you guys. I'm getting there. Four more chapters to go. It's kind of that, uh, like, not that I even race, but as a kid, you know, when you had to like run the mile at school. Did anybody else have to do that? I don't hope, I hope that it wasn't just us. Um, you'd round the corner and you like can see the end, but you also know that you have to get there and that sucks. I'm in that point where I'm like, it's here. I'm almost to it. I can see the end, um, but I have to get there. So today I went down. If anybody, I don't know if anybody has written anything long, like a longer form thing, but sometimes when I'm writing, I'll go down these weird like rabbit holes of thought where I'm like, oh, I should talk about the cycle of violence here and like how abuse, people who are abused can become abusers, but not as much as we think and talk about the stats behind that. And I wrote like half a page or two pages, of, not two pages, half a page or a page of it. And then was like, mm, no, that doesn't work. And so I deleted it and I was frustrated. But the end is nigh. I am almost done. Um, and thank you to all of my Patreon patrons for sending in their stories and what triggers feel like them and all the stuff throughout. I've been asking for stuff for the book about trauma for since I started. So thank you all for sending those in. So that's what I was doing today. And now it is time to get into your questions. Um, I pulled 11, I believe 12, <gasps> 12. So we'll get through all of these. Um, yeah, I'm excited. These are good questions. You guys always have great questions. Um, but also I'm excited because on Saturday, so I'm filming this on a Tuesday on Saturday, Sean and I go on vacation and I'm going to try to record another one of these before we go. Um, so that you guys don't have to wait another week. Um, but if not, we may take a break. I'm not sure, but I think, I think I'll be able to squeeze it in. Um, just depends, but I'm excited. I need a vacation. So hardcore. You guys, I mean, I'm sure everybody feels this way. I just need to get out of my house. Like, please please. Um, and we're going to a place that has a pool. We, we got an Airbnb. So it's like at a house with a pool, we can cook our own food, all this stuff, COVID very friendly. We drive there. It's going to be great. I'm excited. Uh, is it Saturday yet? I'm just kidding. Okay. Let's get into your questions. Enough of me rambling about my day and what's going on. Um, question number one says, hi, Katie, I've heard of repressing bad memories, but is it possible to repress good memories? I had a traumatic childhood and had a lot of bad memories as a result, but as hard as I try, I can only recall a couple of good memories. I've been thinking a lot on this and trying to find answers online, but I can't find anything on the subject. I plan on talking to my therapist about it this week, but I was wondering if you've heard, if you've seen or heard of this. Thank you so, so much. Your videos have been a godsend as I work on my mental health. Um, of course, you're very welcome. I'm glad that it's been helpful. And there were some comments. Also, somebody said somewhat along those lines, I had a rocky relationship with my father. And now looking back at what I thought were happy memories make me realize that he was just manipulating me like he is now. How can I get past this? And then another um, another person said, I've been wondering something similar. Uh, if I maybe just forgot about feeling safe or being close to my parents or if it just didn't happen. Okay, so I have a lot to talk about. And you guys should feel very lucky because I wrote a whole chapter on trauma memories, how they're different, repressed memories, what those are, all that shit. So I've done a ton of research about this. And the truth is 
that we do not repress positive memories, okay? The, the only reason that a re, what would be considered a quote-unquote positive memory would not be easily recalled as if it butted up against a bad memory. And often when we have complex PTSD, or for those of you who don't know what that means, just when we're repeatedly traumatized throughout our life, um, when we have CPTSD, a, we can have these whole chunks of memory that are just gone, right? Like, I don't remember anything from the time I was four to 12. A lot of my patients have said that over the years. A lot of you have told me that you have these huge chunks of time where you don't remember anything, good or bad, right? So that's really the only reason that a good memory wouldn't be able to be recalled uh, along with the fact that things can be a long time ago and it's not easy to recall those memories because um, if you haven't watched the movie Inside Out it's a Pixar movie I highly recommend it it really does give you a visual representation of how memories are formed but it, it's kind of like in the back of your memory where they're not really being used and they might be rolling off into um kind of to be disposed of. I forget what they call it in the film, but it's like um, every night our brain cleans out things it's not using anymore, memories that aren't rel like aren't related to anything important, aren't necessary with for our life, and we just kind of purge them, right? We, can't, we don't need to keep everything. It's like the same reason that I get, uh, get rid of a shirt that has a hole in it that I just don't use anymore, you know, and keep others. So our brain does the same type of thing. It's like a spring cleaning uh, every night. So we do not repress good memories. However, um, the traumas could have gotten in the way. And I want to make sure, sorry, there was something else. Um, I'm thinking a lot. Okay, so because you had a traumatic childhood, that doesn't mean that we have no good memories, but I believe they're being like blocked up by the trauma. Um, and that's really my answer about it. Um, we do not repress the positive ones because there's nothing to repress. The reason that we repress memories, just FYI, maybe this will give more context. And then I want to answer those kind of follow-up questions. Um, the reason that we repress memories is because it allows us to survive. It's a way for our brain to be like, uh, I don't know what to do with this. This is too much. Um, we'll just hide it over here for a while, right? Like I've talked about with the in going on with the Inside Out movie um, as an analogy, the memories in that film are represented as marbles. And when you have a trauma, it's like those marbles, whoosh, like sc scatter, like it hits the floor, we drop it and it splinters everywhere, right? Like if you've ever broken a glass in your kitchen, you're like still finding shards unfortunately for a while you know my mom used to always make me wipe with a wet paper towel to get all the little splinters but I just I really like that representation that visual I, I guess um for trauma memories because they split they like go everywhere and that is why when we has a smell a certain smell or there's like a time of year that's really triggering right we step on one of those splinters and we're like shoot we're flashback we're shot back to that memory anyways I say all of that because um, that's why we repress them is they're too much to manage we don't know how to file them away in a cohesive story because we couldn't stay present for it there's a lot of times dissociation involved when it comes to trauma and trauma memories um, and in order to persevere sorry I have an itch here um, probably a tickle hair um, but when because we have to survive and persevere, we uh, repress things because we can't. It's like, what do I do with this thing? I don't know what to do with this thing. So I'm just going to hide it away here for a while, right? It's almost like a very, very unhealthy and intense version of a DBT technique called back burner. I'm not saying it's the same, but you know what I mean? When you're like, oh, I can't deal with this right now. I'll deal with this tomorrow at 2 p.m. I have time. Okay. This is like, I'll deal with this never. Um, until it comes up and bothers me again. So that's why we repress. Uh, happy memories do not meet that criteria. There'd be no reason for our brain to repress them. Um, okay. And then the comments following, like some, what along those lines, I had a rocky relationship with my father. Now looking back at what I thought were happy memories made me realize um, that he was just manipulating me like he is now. How do I get past this? Now, that kind of reminded me uh, another part of Inside Out is where sadness. So if you don't know, there's like, uh, joy, sadness, uh, disgust, and anger, and uh, what's the other? Anyway, there's her, her main core feelings are in her brain, and they're like running things in, in this girl Riley's brain. Um, anyway, sadness starts touching memories, and she doesn't know why she's drawn to do it. And it's the voice uh, that had sadness's voice is Phyllis from The Office, and it's just so perfect. But anyway, she's like, oh, I don't know why. Oh, she's like touching memories that used to be happy and joyful and turning them into sadness. And I feel like that's kind of what's happening with this comment where you're saying that, you know, um, you felt like your dad was just manipulated. Like you look back now and you thought it was happy, but with 
with the lenses and the knowledge that you have now, you're like, fuck, man, that was just that's just him manipulating me. And it can taint our memories. Um, but it also is kind of like eyes wide open. And in a way, I think of it as even though it's super depressing and super difficult and we have to grieve, but it can be kind of eye opening and help us look at other relationships and see patterns of behavior and make sure that we're doing what's right for us and being in relationships that are right for us. And so I see it as a positive, but yes, there's this underlying need to grieve, which is how you get past this. The unfortunate thing about our parents is that they're not perfect. A lot of them don't try their best. A lot of them are abusive and it's really as children, we think our parents know everything. They can do everything. Um, we can think amazing things about them because they're the o- potentially like the only adult that's really in our life that way, right? That's close caretaker adult. And we rely on them for things. So we have them held in like this, this certain, I don't know, like I don't want to say like pedestal or a certain esteem, but it's like we hold them to a certain standard or a belief, even if it's false. And when we realize as we get older, which all of us realize this to some extent, I remember when I realized that my dad couldn't fix everything. I was like devastated. My dad was like a total Mr. Fix it. So when we have this realization that, well, fuck, he wasn't even nice. He's just manipulating me. Sounds like a narcissist, to be honest. Um, We have to grieve that realization slash the difference between what we perceived or believed or hoped and what the reality is. And so what I would encourage you to do to get past this is to cry about it, feel about it, talk about it, journal about it, whatever you need to do to get out what you're going through and allow yourself to feel all the feelings. It's perfectly fine to feel angry, then to feel sad, then to feel like you really want to connect with them, um, to, to still love them. That's okay. I just want you to know that, that having a parent that's abusive or manipulative or anything like that doesn't mean you can't still have love for them, okay? Um, that's really the only way is just to grieve and to be sad about it and to feel it. And I wish there was a better way where it was like, oh, this magic tool that we have or this therapeutic technique fits and, f- and helps, you know, fix everything. It, it's more like, hey, you've been, you realize something that's really devastating and you just have to feel it and feel sad about it until it doesn't have any weight over you anymore. Because you're like, you know what, I've thought about this every which way I've been sad about it for a long time. And that doesn't mean that you won't grieve in different periods, right? It's not like all your grief has to happen at once. I don't want you to think there's like a beginning, middle and end in that way. Grief is weird. Um, there might be some times when you think, oh, I should just maybe, you know, my dad, I remember that time. And then you're like, oh, fuck, no, that was him manipulating me. Shit. And then, you know, you'll grieve again. So just know that it's okay to grieve. It's okay to feel it. Um, it's okay to be sad about it. And that's really the way that we get past it is by going through it. Um, and then the, the final component to this says, I've been wondering about something similar if I maybe just forgot about feeling safe or being close to my parents, or if it just didn't happen. Again, kind of back to my initial answer, we can forget positives, because they get like wrapped up in the negative. And that's why we'll have these periods of no memory. Um, That's really the only reason. If you're like, no, but I like remember other things from that time, like I remember all the shitty times, and there aren't like little blips of positive or, oh, yeah, and then my sister and I went and did this fun thing, or I don't know, I'm just making up stuff. But it may have not, what I'm saying is if there's not those things that kind of come through as you work through the negative ones so that more of your memories in general are available to you, if you don't have those positive ones come up, it, it's possible that either you haven't worked on the memory that's closest to that or it just didn't happen, that there weren't, you know, positive memories at that time. That doesn't mean positive things didn't happen. I don't want it to be like all or nothing black and white, like dark, deep and, you know, nasty and, and happy. It, it's just that... um maybe, you know, it's a long time ago, and maybe we just don't recall those little blips of happiness. We don't really have any of those happy memories. And the ones that we did have were so few and far in between that it's just not easy to recall. Does that make sense? Um, I hope that it does. And I hope you understand, but we do not repress good memories. um, Unless it's part of that like blackout zone of like, you know, the three years that you sustained the worst of the abuse or trauma or whatever. Okay, question number two. Hi, Katie. Is it normal to be defensive and sad without knowing why? 
In front of people, I'm always snappy and mad. Everything is so irritating and overwhelming. When I get home, I'll spend the whole afternoon wanting to cry but not be able to. I'll stay up late with a horrible tingling in my body and a sense of dread looming over me. Around 2 to 3, two thirty a.m., um, when the night air is completely quiet, I will completely break down and cry my heart out. I feel so numb. I can only see my feelings being expressed, but I can't feel or know what caused them. Why? Because you're letting your anger hide the real emotion and the real situation. We're just not tapping in, which is, is very, very normal. By the way, this got a shit ton of thumbs ups. So you're not alone. And I think um, a couple of things. First of all, when we're defensive and angry and irritated, that's it's usually I've talked about this um, in a recent video. It's usually a secondary emotion, meaning that anger is protective, right? It's like uh, it's like the puffer fish on my shirt. I don't know if you can see it. I, if you didn't realize, I have new Katie Morton merch. Um, but we want I want to make this black instead of white, and we want to make the uh, the little puffer fish and Katie a little thicker font. Um, so stay tuned for that. Um, but when we're uh, being angry and irritated and snappy, that's us being a puffer fish. We're sticking our spines out um, with that emotion to protect the inside part of us that just feels really hurt and sad. Um, however, because we suppress this and try to, you know, ignore it and push it down until it becomes so overwhelming, we aren't going to be able to figure out where those emotions are coming from because we can't identify them in the moment and I'm not saying like again this is super super normal uh I don't know if I, I probably shared this quite a few times but when I wrote my first book are you okay um I reached out to friends and family we end up not even including this I don't know why my editor made me do all this legwork and then nothing um but I he wanted me to get people in my life to share to do one of the exercises with you in the book and so I think he only used mine, but it was like in their handwriting, they're supposed to write five feelings they felt that that day um, and, and put, use those words in a sentence. So instead of using the feeling word angry, you'd have to say, you know, I felt really agitated and irritated at, you know, my brother because he said he was going to help me and he didn't. I don't know. I'm just making something up. Um, anyways, by trying to do that, by reaching out to my friends and family and ask them to do this, only one of them didn't have a tough time. My mom's boyfriend, Larry, he came through. He totally got it. He was like, yeah, I can do that. Okay. And my mom, Sean, some of my friends, it, they were like, oh, uh, I don't, what if I don't know? <laughs> so I only bring that up to tell you that you're not alone. A lot of people don't know how we feel and even more so why, because why is that step further, right? How many of us just by a raise of hands at home or wherever you're listening, if you're walking, raise your hand. How many of us, uh, if I asked you to identify one feeling right now, maybe wouldn't know what it is? Or how many of us have repressed how we felt at one point or another because it just, you know, we didn't feel safe to express it. We didn't know how to express it or we were scared to express it, right? Uh, which I guess is kind of the safe thing. But anyway, um, we all do it. We all stuff our emotions down. Um, and that makes it really difficult for us to know why we feel the way we feel because there's no connection in the moment to it. And so the best way for you to be able to um, to understand the why behind these is I want you to start tracking every day, print out a feelings chart, a feelings chart. And by the way, I'm looking into creating my own because I really like the circular ones. And I don't know. Anyway, I'm going to make like a color coded one. Stay tuned. Um, it'll be available probably in Patreon or community tab or something. Um, anyway, Print out a feelings chart or just check one out online. Have one like open on a tab or bookmark it on your phone or whatever. And I want you to try to identify one emotion each day this week. Okay, so this is coming out on a Thursday until next Thursday. I want you to come up with one emotion each week. Then the next week, I want you to not only identify one emotion, but then I want you to track it back to what caused it. Okay, so if I feel I'm irritated today, okay, I'll be honest, I was a little, I was not a little irritated, I was very irritated. And why am I irritated? Because I spent like hours working on this chunk of a book that will never exist because it, I had to delete it because it didn't make any sense. And it wasn't pertinent. It didn't flow with the story of what I was telling or the story I was telling, I guess. Um, so yeah, so I'm irritated. And then it made me sad because I was like, Oh, I thought I'd get so much farther. And then, um, you know, so Try to figure out the reasons behind that emotion. And then I would like you to grow that. So 
first week we're doing one emotion. The second week we're, we're doing one and then we're trying to figure out what caused it that day. Um, and then the third week, I want you to do two emotions and we're going to keep doing this two emotions and three emotions, um, getting better at just identifying how you feel and what has happened. Uh, even if it's a couple weeks back, if you're like, you know, I'm feeling agitated because I saw that jerk from work who said they were going to help me out with that project and they never did and they didn't follow through or they screwed it up or I don't know. You might have something that's tracked back farther and that's totally fine. I just want you to start identifying it and I want you to start being able to recognize how you feel because so often we just go through life completely cut off. Like we don't even recognize how we feel ever. Um, and that's very normal and it's okay. But this will help you stop feeling so numb. We just have to start tapping in in a very safe way. Um, yeah, and that would be, I mean, that'll really help. And if you can start to journal along with those, like keeping track of those feelings and what, why, like why you felt the way you felt, um, you can journal along with that and that can help too. Okay, are we ready? We're moving on. Number three. And this is a great question too. You guys have such good questions. It says, um, oh, I made a mistake. I think we might only have 11 questions. I had an extra enter in there with just a number with nothing. Yep, only 11 questions. I'm sorry, you guys. Okay, um, question number three. How can you tell the difference between enough self-care to get you through your day and being too focused on yourself? I've been accused before of being too focused on myself when I feel like I need some downtime. I'm still able to hold a job and get done what needs to be done around the house. So I don't feel like I'm slipping into unhealthy habits. But how can you really know? Thanks for everything. And someone left a comment on this that was like, yeah, I spend like an hour every night journaling and I'd like to cut that down or I'd like to, you know, to make more time for other things, right? Because we all have a lot of things that we want to do or a lot of things that are being asked of us. Um, the, the truth is, is if, the, and I don't want, I kind of even hate to say this because I don't want anybody to take this as like permission to not do self-care because that's not my goal. But if we aren't able to do something, like let's say we aren't able to journal one night or something for that person who does it oh, an hour every day. If we aren't able to do it one night, does ever do like the wheels come off the cart? Like, are we able to to function or then is it no go because the truth is if we find like our we're kind of tracking like we might think we're doing too much okay but if we go back what's too little right then what's over here where then we can't don't feel good and we don't feel um like we're getting enough self-care we want to find we want to truthfully I want to have a little buffer in here where I'm doing a little more than is necessary because there's going to be days where I can't do any and I'm going to kind of it's like we're building Self-care is really just like good old fashioned resiliency, right? So we're building all these tools and techniques and things that we do to take care of ourselves so that when we have shitty things happen to us, let's say we're processing a trauma or let's say we have like a whole week of work where people are getting laid off and we're worried we're going to get laid off. Um, I know that's happening with a lot of people right now. Unfortunately, it's super stressful. If that's happening, we, we want to be able to dig into our treasure trove of self-care, all the things we built up. Um, over the you know, months or years or whatever, want to be able to pull from that. It's almost like a bank account, right? So I think the, I don't know. And for someone to say you're, you accuse you of being too focused on yourself, that just feels very invalidating and very toxic. I don't know that person, but it feels not, it, it feels very selfish on their account, like that they don't, won't allow you to do what you need to do to feel good. Um, not to mention that I'm more of it on the introverted side of things. And so I need like alone time. Like that's very important for me. That's de definitely a big part of um, my self care. And if I don't get that alone time, I feel like dysregulated. Um, so I guess you can test and you can remove some things. But I would err on the side of doing more rather than less. And if you have people in your life that are mad that you're doing more, um, and it, the, the one caveat in there is, because I've had patients do this too, is that are you doing so much self-care that you legitimately have no time for anything else? Like I had this patient who, it was very much rigid. It was into her eating disorders, ended up being eating disorder based, but very rigid about things. And so part of our work together was to, to break those, you know, rigid boundaries and, and rules. Um, but she had all this stuff she had to do. Like she had to go for a walk for X number of minutes and cover X number of miles. And then she'd have to talk to uh, 
her friend for at least 20 minutes and she had to journal for another hour and then she had to uh what was it like color or knit um she had all these things she do it every night so much so that she didn't have any social life and this was before covid so it was like she could be social sorry my nose is itching um anyway so that we that could be a problem as well. So if it's getting in the way of you being able to engage with people and do other things in your life that you need to, which it doesn't sound like for this person, it is affecting that. But it might be affecting your relationship because that person is saying that to you. Um, I would talk to them about that. Like you said that I'm too focused on myself, you know, and I just, I kind of felt like that was my self care and I need downtime. Um, can we come to a compromise? Because like if it was Sean and I, right, if it's a spouse, if it's someone I live with, he could say to me, you know, I'd like to have some time to talk to you in the evening. You don't even come out of the back room or something, you know, like you're, you're, you're journaling or you're you know, talking to your therapist or your mom or whatever. And, and I'd like to have some time. I'm going to have to compromise with that. And so that's why we have to find other ways to fit it in. Um, but I do not believe there is too much self-care unless it's getting in the way of us being able to engage with life. Um, yeah. Does that, I hope that makes sense. Um, because there's just, there's so much to that, right? It's like, we all need to do some self care. And self care, by the way, is not just fucking massages and face masks. I don't know when, like the wellness, like, uh, I don't know, buy, buy, buy more consumerism, like took over self care. Self care is actually like for me, is um, sometimes just reading a book, or sitting in a quiet room and like cleaning my desk because my desk is like a disaster. Um, things like that, that's self-care for me. And that doesn't have to cost us anything. You don't have to buy anything to do self-care. Self-care is just, you know, maybe it's like taking a longer shower or maybe it's rubbing your feet or maybe it's coloring. It could be any number of things, but it does not have to be you purchasing things. It could just be you taking some time to yourself. So I hope that that helps. I hope that that explains it a little bit. Um, yeah, and that person who says you're too focused on yourself, I'm very suspicious of them. I would watch that relationship, see if they always want all the attention. Just, just you know, curious. Okay, question number four it says, hi, Katie. I have a, a picture perfect, uh, it says a paper picture perfect family. I, I get what they mean. Uh, problem is I've never felt loved or cared for. I know my parents love and care for me, but I never feel any of the love, care, and support I'm supposedly getting. It's gotten to the point where I can't bring myself to tell them anything. I can't say I'm loved to other people without feeling like I'm brainwashed. I can't tell my parents I love you without feeling guilty because I don't know if I do. Sometimes I wish I was never their child. Am I crazy? Why can't I just be a normal child in a normal family? Why can't I feel loved? I'm going into a crazy fantasy about having teachers or friends or parents as or my friend's parents as my parents. I'm so scared. I don't know what to do. I really enjoyed this question because this is very, very common. And I have two thoughts on it. And someone actually, I think it was uh, left a comment on this about, um, about part of where my brain goes. So kudos to you guys. But the first component of this is it is possible that your parents are emotionally neglectful. Just because our parents look good on paper, right? They, we have a nice house, they give us nice clothes, they take us to a nice school, they feed us, um, they make sure we do our homework, you know, they ask, they ask how our day was, like parents can do all the stuff that makes it look like they're a good parent. However, what we're missing is true connection, having a parent rub our back while we cry, asking us how we're doing, checking in on us in a real way, making time for real conversations, not only rewarding positive behavior. I've heard from a lot of you that your parents only allow for like positive emotions. So if we have like a shitty day and we say to our parents, hey, I'm just feeling really bad and down and they'll come at you with like, well, well you have things. It's like that in toxic positivity that I talked about in my video recently. They'll come at you with a, well, you have everything. I've given you everything that you need. You have no reason to feel that way. Come on, pull yourself out of it or let's go for a walk or you know what I mean? They'll try to like distract you from feeling bad instead of listening to you and saying that must have been hard. Do you want to talk about it? And so I want to put that out there because that's very, very common. And I have some videos about the emotionally absent mother and emotionally absent father. I think I have both of those. I just forget what they're called, but I bet if you look them up on YouTube, Katie Morton, emotionally absent they'll both come up um because I usually tag things pretty well so there's that and then the second which is what someone oh sorry it's not you it's me because I'm talking too much I gotta yawn the second thing 
our love languages. And this is something that doesn't get talked enough about. And maybe I should make an entire video about that, but I just feel like it's someone else's thing. Like love languages aren't, I don't know, I'll have to see. I guess if I reference them. Anyway, I'll work it out. I'll figure it out. That'll be a, one of my ideas. And I'll put that in here so I don't forget. Uh, video on love languages. Okay. Anyway, uh, if you don't know what love languages are, it is the way that each of us individually communicate love and care. And there are five of them that they identify, okay? There's gift giving, like if I express love through getting you something nice that I know you like, it's not one of my personal uh, love languages, but it's a lot of people's love languages, right? Gift giving. So there's gifts. Then there's words of affirmation. If you need to hear, you're important. I see you. I hear you. I feel for you. I love you. I care about you. Words of affirmation can be very important. And, and you know, and so we, all of us like all of the love languages, but we usually have a primary one or two, okay? Gifts, um, words of affirmation, shared activities. This is one of mine. And this is when you get to do stuff together, right? You get to go on a hike together. You get to travel together. You get to, I don't know, just experience things and make plans and do things together. Could even be like you clean the house together. You make dinner together. Those are all shared activities, okay? Then there... Um, and oh God, I'm blanking. Hold on, you guys. Uh, physical touch. If you, you know, we all need some physical touch. Sometimes you want a really nice long hug. Sometimes you just want someone to really uh, rub our back, touch our feet, uh, you know, all sorts of things. So we have gifts. We have words of affirmation. We have uh, shared activities. We have physical touch. And then my number one, acts of service. And this is when someone does something for you. Like, oh, I know you're out of town and you were busy and blah, blah, blah. Um, so I washed your car, filled up the gas and I cleaned the house or something. I'd be like, what? I love you so hardcore right now. Like doing something for me, an act of service is like, whoa, you're speaking my love language. I am so into you right now. I need to, you know, I need to share, share love back to you. And that's actually how I show love is through acts of service and doing something for someone else. And so if you recognize which love language you speak and which love language, more importantly, your partner or your friends or your family speak, and I know it seems like, wow, that's a lot to ask. People love to take quizzes. Send your family the quiz. There's quizzes online for Revive Love Languages. Make sure it's the one that's like reputable from the people. I think it's like two, is it two or three psychologists and therapists that created it? Make sure it's theirs. I think it's two people. I think it's a couple. But anyway, so find that reputable uh, quiz. Send it out to your friends and family and have them take it and report back so that you can make sure that you know what they like. Um, sounds kind of silly, but even as I say that, I'm like, I should do that for some more people because I only know my moms and Sean's. Um, I don't know my brothers or uh, my sister-in-law or some of my close friends. So figuring that out can help. And they may just speak a different love language. Maybe you want physical touch and your family's not very touchy. So you don't feel the love because maybe it's like me speaking Tagalog to you when all you speak is German. It's lost in translation, right? No one's understanding each other. I'm not feeling the love from you and you're not feeling the love from me. When we're both speaking, I, I mean, English, we could say, or if we're both speaking Spanish together, then we understand. And I think of love languages like that, like each one is different. And so I really, um, I think that that could be a possibility too, but only you know what's happening. So I would encourage you to think about those two options. Like, do we feel like they're just not there for us like at all? Like they're emotionally absent. We can never talk about how we feel like bad ways or anything like that. It's only positive. Um, we, you know, maybe it's toxic positivity in your home, or maybe they don't make any time to communicate or is it that they do things for you, but that's just not what you want. And if it is that second one, I encourage you, I mean, it's the first one, we should get into therapy and, and heal and process from that because it's really abuse. It's kind of like emotional abuse. It's a form of it. So um, talk to someone. But then the uh, when it comes to the love languages, then we're going to have to communicate what we need. We're going to have to communicate about what our love language is or what we're going to need from them. Like I've told Sean all the time, I'm like, I really appreciate that you like to buy me gifts. However, I love it even more if you just clean the house or if you um, drive, you drive us around. I don't have to drive or you make dinner. Um, he's really great at doing that, by the way. But those are things that actually resonate with me and uh, uh, 
express love to me, I guess. So yeah, think about those things and communicate that and to everybody, communicate that to those in your life. Um, I think it'll really help. Okay. Question number five, dear Katie, I hope you're well. I am. Thank you. My therapist pointed out that I put a lot of effort into trying to stay one step ahead of her. I see what she means. I'm always trying to figure out what she thinks and tend to constantly edit what I say without even meaning to. Hmm. It's like I'm trying to control the impressions I give her, even though I don't think it's a productive way to approach therapy. I'm not doing it on purpose. I don't really notice it at the moment. And for those reasons, I don't know how to stop. Since I'm constantly editing, I feel like I'm not being as open with my therapist as I could be. I'll talk about any topic, but everything I say has to be rehearsed and carefully chosen. If we somehow land on a topic I haven't prepared at all, my mind goes blank. I do this editing with everyone in my life, and I think it's part of why I don't feel connected with others as I'd like. Have you had this come up with your patients? How do you help them be more forthright and spontaneous and open? Thank you. Uh, this got a lot of likes as well. And I found this very interesting in... in um, as with many of these answers, it kind of depends on the person. The first place my brain went, which a lot of you are probably be like, what is OCD? So, so many of my patients who have OCD, which is obsessive compulsive disorder. I have videos about it on my Katie Morton channel. If you want to learn more. Um, so many of them do this like fact checking, uh, making sure they're using the words correctly, spell check, all sorts of crazy things running in their heads 24 seven, making sure that they come across just perfectly. Okay. And so that obsession, um, it, I, I believe it's like anxiety driven through our OCD. So that could be it. Um, and if that is the case, the, the true best treatment for um, OCD is actually exposure therapy, which I know is super uncomfortable and people just ran and hid. But by exposing ourselves, like not com doing the compulsion, right? Not doing the thing that our obsession tells us to do, meaning running all that stuff through our head. Like if we force ourselves to not prepare and somebody did say, uh, I think it was the person who asked this question and replied to someone else and said, I've not uh, prepared and the therapy didn't go as well. So in a way we've almost like exposed ourselves to it. And now, um, and, and we gave ourselves more evidence to the fact that we need to prepare. I would actually, on the other side, I'd encourage you to just stop preparing as much as possible and let it see, like, let us see where it goes and tell your therapist about this, obviously. Um, since she pointed it out, just say, I'm going to try my best, but I know that I won't be as prepared and all my brain will go blank and stuff. And that's okay. We don't have to know what we're going to say or how we want to say things. Um, that's exhausting. And I think that's why it's bothering you. You know, you don't even notice you're doing it, but she's, but now that you've, now that your therapist has pointed it out, you're like, oh my God, that's why therapy is so powerful. That's one of those like aha moments, even though it's a shitty aha moment, but I think people think aha moments are like, wow, we huge, like revelations that are so great. And oh my God, I didn't see that. But a lot of aha moments are like, well, fuck man. Like you see this whole pattern and you're like, shit, like that's how they've been for me a lot. Cause you're like, oh fuck, I guess I do do that. That's how it is. And I think that's kind of what happened. And you had like an aha moment. Um, so it could be OCD. I would talk to your therapist and ask about this and I would try to not do it. Also, I'm just curious because I do believe this is anxiety driven one way or another, whether it's OCD or not, we do not know yet. But I am curious and I would ask, I would do some CBT, what we call downward arrow questioning. So it's like, okay, so if you didn't prepare for therapy, what would happen? Or what do you think would happen? And you'd say, it's not going to go well. And I'd say, okay, well, if therapy doesn't quite go well, I mean, also I have a question, another question I add in there, I'd be like, when you say it doesn't go well, what does that mean? Like, what, what does therapy not going well look like? Hmm. Okay, so if that happens, then what? And then, okay, you let's say you say, um, you know, therapy won't go well, then, then I don't get as much out of each session. Okay, so let's say you didn't get as much out of a session. Well, then what? Well, then it's going to take me longer to feel better. Well, are you feeling better now, like doing this thing? Does that make you feel better? Huh. You know, and we just keep going down and down. So then, okay, so if you didn't get as much out of therapy, okay, it's going to take you longer. Okay, um, so you feel like you're wasting their time. You're wasting your time and money. Okay, uh, maybe it gets down to the core belief, I'm not worth it or I'm not enough. Or I'm not good enough. I'm not lovable. I'm not, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not. It's usually something like that. And I'd be curious if that's kind of where it's coming from. Because this is probably something you've been doing 
all over with everybody else. And it might not be with your friends and family. Um, like, but it sounds like it might be said that maybe that's why you don't feel as connected to others because they don't actually know you because they don't get to have you put together your thoughts and formulate them in person in a real way where you can be candid. It's like being candid is, is too, is too vulnerable. And so anyway, I have a lot of questions about that. I think, um, that, I mean, that's how I work with my patients. I ask a shit ton of questions and I'm always curious about everything, like, which I know has driven some of you crazy on our like uh, Patreon hangouts and live streams. Um, however, I will always ask like, uh, so what does it mean for therapy to not go well? Or I'll pick out a word. I'll be like, hmm, interesting. I've been doing this with my patients a lot too, where they'll, they'll use a certain word, let's say, well, that would just be uncomfortable. And I'll be like, well, explain to me what uncomfortable means. Or they'll say, well, that that's fine for other people. And I'll like be like, other people, so not you. Why is it not fine for you? Anyway, I would have a lot of questions about this. Like, what is it that you're trying to protect yourself from? What would be the, you know, I what, Okay, so if that happened, then what? If that happened, then what? Then what? Then what? I want to see where we get with that, that downward arrow questioning. I'd be very curious. Um, and what's so bad about our mind going blank? And why are we preparing? You know, I, I'd just be very interested. And so I truly think that, yes, it's it's causing you to not feel connected with people because you're editing. So the, there is this false belief somewhere in there that you as you is not good enough. That's what I think the root of this is. That would be my hypothesis. So there's that belief and we're acting out of that belief. So how do we stop it? We stop editing ourselves, and we start answering those questions. If that, then what? Okay, if that, then what? Well, what would that mean? Uh, interesting. So then what would that mean? Going down, down, down. Um, and then we have to challenge it, right? Have we, uh, are there people who've wanted to connect more with you? Do people feel very connected to you and you don't feel to them? You know, let's look for some evidence. Let's be curious about our relationships. Let's talk with our therapist about it. Um, and I believe you'll come up with some answers that will help untangle this and help you kind of figure out why you have this like innate urge so much so that it's like completely unconscious at this point to edit yourself on the fly all the time. Well, not on the fly, I guess ahead of time, but all the time. Um, yeah. And I wish I had like an answer, like, boom, this will fix it. But that's really the answer is like, we have to figure out why we have to be curious, uh, not judgmental. I don't want any judgment in this. We all do things to help uh, continue the false belief that we've had since childhood. We all do shit like that. Okay. Um, I know that we like to think that we don't, but we all do. I even do. I, oh, I definitely have that belief that like me as myself is not enough. Like, uh, I always think, oh, my book's going to be a turd. Oh, this is never going to turn out. Uh, right. But I have to fight back. I have to argue with facts. And so you can do that too, but we have to figure out what it is for you, what that belief is and what you're acting out of and why, or is it OCD? Could be OCD, which is kind of a different animal, but still work that you do in therapy. Keep us posted. Okay. Moving on to question number six. Hi, Katie. We always have themes every week, you guys. I love it. Okay. I mean, I don't love it because it's where people are hurting. I don't like that, but it's just interesting. How can I forgive my parents for emotionally neglecting me as a child? Ever since I realized it happened, there's a lot of sadness, anger, and disappointment that I feel towards them. Completely understandable. Growing up, I was often ignored when I showed negative emotions. Mm hmm or told to stop behaving the way that I did when I showed these emotions until I gave up on the sharing everything event or until I gave up on sharing anything eventually because no one cared about my feelings anyways. It took me years to get into therapy and a long time until I slowly started opening up to my therapist. I told my parents I needed more space from them, but they want to talk about the past and have a relationship. I feel like they've changed, but I don't know if I can or will be able to connect because there's still a lot of hurt. And I still don't know if I truly want that. How can I ever build a relationship with my parents? And how can I deal with all the disappointment I feel? Shouldn't I be able to forgive them since it seems like they changed? No. Okay. And I don't want to, I talked about this in, I think it's my video just like called forgiveness. Sorry. I'm checking that I'm recording. Okay, because it's pushed back. Usually I can see it and I couldn't see it. And all of a sudden I was like, oh, what if we're not recording? Okay. Um, I talked about this in my video about forgiveness, how forgiveness does not have to equate to reconciliation. I'm going to say that again. I want you to hear it. 
Forgiveness does not have to equate to reconciliation. Too often we feel like because someone has changed and we forgive them for their past, you know, actions or whatever, that that means that now we have a relationship. Uh -uh. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Just because we've like let ourselves off the hook of anger, uh, shame, uh, frustration, resentment, that doesn't mean that we have to welcome them back into our life. That's not the same thing. So I just want you to hear that. Okay. And in order to forgive them, it's really all work that we do on ourselves. It has nothing to do with them changing. You could forgive them if they hadn't changed, okay? But you may want to, if you so desire, engage in a relationship with them and reconcile because they have changed, cool? But when it comes to forgiveness, we have to express what we need to express, feel how we need to feel. That could be grief. That could be a bunch of anger. It could be upset, sadness. It could be all the things, right? We have to process it through on our own and make a decision for ourselves that we are going to forgive them. We don't even have to let them know we're forgiving them, by the way. That's something that we do internally. I've done this uh, recently with someone who's just always been treating me poorly and talking shit to me and just about me and just bad. And I was like, you know what? i I don't want to feel angry about that anymore. So I forgive them. I don't want them in my life because they're not a good person. However, I do forgive them because I don't actually think the way that I was able to forgive this particular person is I don't think they really recognize what they're doing. That doesn't make it okay. See, forgiveness does not equal reconciliation. It just means I am going to let myself out of this. I'm the one holding myself trapped to the floor with this anger, resentment, upset. And so are you. And that doesn't mean we have to forgive quickly, right? But that does mean that we should be taking action to process how we feel, to to get some validation through therapy for me and, uh, you know, talking to Sean and my mom and just people in my life, right? I get validation for how I feel and the experience I've had. And then I let myself out. I get up off the floor and let myself out the door and decide to not come back. And that's letting, that's the forgiveness part. The reconciliation would be if I then decide to go back in their other door, you know, and I know that might not be a very good analogy and it might not be very visual for some of you, but I just really think that's what's important to tease out. And when it comes to parents who've been emotionally neglectful, we have to process the trauma to not call emotional neglect trauma is just such a disservice to it because all of the needs that we have as humans, and especially when we're children, because we're primed for connection from birth. You've heard in my videos with Alexa years ago, who's a trauma specialist, how even the mere act of sucking and swallowing, like when you're fed as a child, uh, activates our uh, polyvagal system, our vagus nerve along our neck, and kind of like here on our, um, what's it called, our collarbone, like around that area. Um, anyway, it activates that system and helps us connect. And the reason that it does that is obviously because they're our caregivers and we want to connect to them, but it's because we need that. We need that social connection. Um, anyway, I won't get into too much of the science or the nerdiness, but Alexa had talked about how important that is and how we're primed from birth to connect. So I just say that so that you know your need for this is not over the top. This isn't crazy. This is normal. This is how we all are. Um, and the way to forgive them is to process it. And to make the decision for yourself that you are, you don't want to have to be angry anymore. It's not doing you any favors. It's not helping. It's not, it's not part of the process. You know what I mean? We have to do our work on our side, clean our side of the street. As my therapist always likes to say, you're responsible for your side of the street, but they're responsible for theirs. Um, and just knowing that forgiveness isn't, uh, it isn't reconciliation. And it also doesn't mean that we condone their behavior. It doesn't mean we accept what they did. It doesn't mean we say, oh, you shit all over me for my whole life. I forgive you. So it's okay that you did that. Mm -mm. It means, hey, it's not okay, but I'm not going to be angry about it anymore because that's not serving me. I forgive you. I understand that you just could not be the person that I needed you to be. Um, and I'm going to let that go. It's kind of like letting that shit go. It's like dropping luggage off or something. Um, and it takes time. And trust me, even personally in my own life, it's like it's this weird where I think I've forgiven them. And then I'm like, da -da -da -da. I can get really angry really quick. And I'm like, you're not letting that go, Katie. That should not have that emotional charge for you. You need to talk about that more. So just 
be uh be open to working through your grief, your anger, um, your sadness, your disappointment towards them, talking it out, journaling it out until it doesn't feel so emotionally charged for you and you're ready to let it go. But that again does not mean reconciliation or condoning their behavior. It just means you are forgiving them. You're you're letting yourself out. I hope that was clear. It's very important that we understand that because too often people think that forgiveness means, oh, I welcome you back with open arms. Uh -uh. Mm -mm. We can choose to do that. If you want to do that, you can, but you do not have to. Um, and the way to build a relationship, if you can't deal with the disappointment you feel, I don't think that you, I think it's one first things first, we have to process and we have to manage the disappointment and the sadness and the anger. Remember, I talked earlier about grieving the difference between what we believed our parents could and should and would be and what they were, we have to grieve that difference. Um, allow yourself to grieve that allow yourself to be angry, allow yourself to be sad about it, allow yourself to just feel it. Then if you want to, that's a big if, if you want to, not if they want to, if you want to have that relationship, then you can start building that from there after the fact, after we've worked on that. Okay, I hope that helps. I know that's hard. That's hard. And a lot of people had a lot of things to say about that. And it got a lot of thumbs up as all these questions did. Question number seven, another good one. Such good questions, you guys always says, I was wondering which mental illnesses are chronic versus temporary. And why is this the case? Can you fully recover? Um, which can you fully recover from and which must you learn to how to manage? Now, there are, okay, I just want to, first of all, most mental illnesses are chronic, but hear me out. That doesn't mean you're going to have symptoms all the time. Um, just like uh, the fact that I could catch the flu one year and then catch the flu another year, or catch a cold one month and then wait a few months, catch a cold again. That's how our mental illness is. If things get stressful, if we don't take care of ourselves and take care of our mental health, right, we can contract an illness. And I'm not saying you can catch a mental illness. I'm just saying when we don't do all that self-care that we were talking about earlier, building that resiliency, we can open ourselves up to more symptoms of our mental illness. So if we struggle with depression, if we start not sleeping well, we don't uh, talk to our therapist, as, you know, maybe we're not going to see them anymore. We stop seeing our friends. We isolate. We uh, binge eat at night we're going to start to feel more depressed. We're going to start feeling real shitty real quick. Um, but if we take care of ourselves, if we make sure we're sleeping, we talk to our therapist, we make make time for friends, even though sometimes we maybe don't want to, um, and we do all the things to take care of ourselves, then we'll start to feel better and the depressive symptoms will go away. Um, so almost all mental illnesses are chronic. However, there are some like acute stress disorder, which is like a precursor to PTSD. Um, I think if it lasts for, oh God, is it like one month or six months? You guys fact check me because I don't have the DSM with me and who really cares? It's just when a, a trauma happens to us, there's a period of time where we can just have acute stress disorder. And I'm not saying just like it's less than, I'm just saying that it just lasts for a shorter period of time. And then if it's more long-term, then it's post-traumatic stress disorder. So acute stress disorder could happen, let's say when we go through a divorce, um, uh, we could have PTSD from these things as well. I'm just saying that it could be like a divorce or maybe we just had to move. Moving can be super, super stressful and we can have a lot of symptoms of PTSD or acute stress disorder as a result. Um, it could be, we got into, you know, uh, a little fender bender and we've never been in one before and we're like a little shaky for like a week or two and then we're like oh we're okay we get back in the car and we're fine uh, we're able to drive again then that would be acute stress disorder so some things are not as chronic they can turn into more chronic things um, and I'm not going to know all the mental illnesses out there um, but there are a lot of things kind of like acute stress disorder it's like um there's even one under schizophrenia and I'm forgetting. I just remember my teacher and you guys, my, this is like, I was studying to take the licensing exam and I took this course. My teacher at the time was like, you get one day to be as floridly psychotic as you want. But when that 24th hour hits, boom, you've got to clear it out because otherwise you can be diagnosed with this. And then it was like after a week or a month, then it becomes schizophrenia. And I forget, I think it's acute psychotic disorder, but I'm not sure. Um, but anyway, so there are some of those that like, hey, we can have something happen for a little period of time and then it'll go away. Possibly if we process it, if we take care of ourselves, um, all that stuff, it might just go away again. But if we don't take care of our mental health, our mental illness, our mental like health symptoms or our mental illness symptoms can come back. And so that's really 
that's really why. So that's why it's the case. Like some of them diagnostically are just short term things and they're uh, usually like uh, triggered by something like a stressor. So, but if they last long, long enough that they can be diagnosed as a bigger thing, that usually means it's going to hang around for a while. It's kind of like we can always catch that cold. Like we're predisposed to catch that cold. Like for instance, I used to always get strep throat. That was like a weaker part of my immune, I don't know, part of my body, I guess. And I got my tonsils out and it's kind of stopped for the most part. But when I get a cold, I always feel it in my throat first. And that's just kind of like if I had had major depressive disorder for a couple of years, but I manage it and use my resilience. To, maybe I'm on medication. Maybe I do my self-care. Maybe I do all those things. That will still be the first one when things get really stressful and upsetting for me that I'll start to feel. I'll feel the depressive symptoms first, you know. Um, yeah. So I hope that that kind of helps. And then it says, okay, I wonder which, why this is the case. Which can you fully recover from? Which must you learn how to manage? I think we always have to learn how to manage in general. We all have a mental health and we need to take care of it just as we do our physical health. It's no different. They are completely intertwined as well. So it's very important for our physical health that we take care of our mental health and vice versa. Um, I hope that that makes sense. But yeah, most, most mental illnesses are chronic. But it doesn't mean we can't manage them so the symptoms go away. Okay, question number eight. Hey, Katie, is it normal to feel reluctant um, about talking about sex related trauma with my male therapist? It's totally normal. And do you have any tips to make it easier? I don't get a choice of therapists as my therapy is through the NHS. I know I hate that system. You can't like if you say you don't like one therapist, then you're like, oh, you're back in the line waiting for like a fucking year. It doesn't make any sense. You should be able to find a good fit. Um, okay. And I feel we're a good fit in other aspects of my therapy. However, with my old therapist who I miss terribly, I was automatically more open about certain things like female related problems, but it just feels wrong to say things like I had a really bad period cramps today. And I think I'm hormonal with a guy, even though I know I'm safe with him. It feels impossible to discuss certain things, but in particular, sexual trauma involving my ex. Any advice? First things first, you knew this was coming journal about it. For all of you who talked about the J-bomb, it was coming. It was just dropping slowly. And here it is. Uh, journal about it, please. Um, it will help for you to put to words why you're so uncomfortable with it. I want you to know this is very normal, by the way. Like, for instance, I had a guy therapist only once for a short period of time. And he wasn't bad at his job or anything. I just did not feel comfortable talking about. And it wasn't even sexually related. I just didn't like seeing a dude. I was like, you're good at your job and all, but I really want to see a woman. Like I'd said in my first book, Are You Okay? Now, when you're picking a therapist, is not the time to be like all PC about it. You, get, you just pick who you want to pick. You can't, you just have to feel good with him. And so I'm glad that you feel connected with him, but we need to start journaling about what it is that makes so uncomfortable. And you have to start bringing that topic, the uncomfortability up in session. And that's always a loophole. That's my first like sneak in that I try with patients is instead of talking about the thing that we don't want to talk about, which is women's troubles, uh, sexual uh, trauma involving an ex, um, maybe you know, I'm not saying with this person, but like, let's say sexual abuse as a child, like things that make us uncomfortable. We don't talk about those things. Let's talk about the fact that we can't talk about those things. Sometimes it helps us open up because then your therapist can ask questions about, are there certain things that I've said or done that are upsetting? Are there ways that you'd want me to ask or engage in these conversations? Is it something that you think you can stay present for? I always ask my patients that if I'm going to push you on this, are you going to dissociate? I'm very curious, you know, because I don't want to do that, like knowingly cause you to dissociate. That's not going to make any sense, right? So journal about it, figure out kind of where it's coming for you. Talk about the reason or talk about the fact that you can't open up in therapy and then start with the things that are a little less embarrassing or difficult to bring up and we'll start building from there because people are people. I mean, I'm, he's a dude, but I'm sure he has at least one woman in his life over the, either a sister, mother, uh, girlfriend, you know, what if regular like a regular friend not romantic friend or not a girlfriend girlfriend but a like a, a platonic friend a female he's got to know about you know periods and cramps and hormones and uh and I'm sure he's had sex and I know that that can kind of feel uncomfortable even me just saying that stuff it, it's interesting um I wish we could get you in to see 
a woman even though you feel like good with him it would make it easier but this is a good challenge it's good for us to figure out why we're uncomfortable with certain things to talk about it openly um, know that it's okay to say you're uncomfortable um, it's actually can be really healing and really good for us to speak up about how we feel and be validated um, and then yeah it start probably with like period cramp things um, or I don't know there's all sorts of different things I'm like Maybe a bra that's cutting into your shoulder, you could mention, or um, you could talk about, um, I don't know, any kind of woman trouble thing that you want to talk about and start from there. Um, but yeah, talk about it first and figure it out. Like, you know, let him ask more questions about it so that you can start to slowly feel safe. Because what we're trying to do is like build this safe uh, foundation from which you can like delve into the trauma you sustained which is you know the goal in therapy is to work through things so we want to get there bring it up I promise it'll be okay um and once you do it it's almost like ripping a band-aid off once you've said something once it, it's not as big of a deal I can speak from personal experience once I've just brought things up with that guy oop, my ring just hit the table um it was it was easier I was just over it kind of it was funny and then I went into this phase of like I don't even care I don't even care I'm just gonna say whatever I want which is how therapy should be and I'm usually that way but with him it just took me I want to say like four or five sessions before I was just like well okay here it is um so yeah so I hope that that kind of helps it, I know it's not an easy do xyz but the kind of like journal about it get to understand it yourself then bring it up in therapy that you just don't feel quite feel comfortable talking about like sex and women's things and and then have your therapist ask about it. Cool? Okay, question number nine. Hi, Katie. Do you ever want to tell a client to just stop complaining? No. I feel like I have this never-ending sequence of circumstances in my life that when I see my therapist, I feel like I'm just complaining about... Uh, I'm just complaining about when I tell him and it makes me wonder what he thinks behind his exterior facade of professionalism. I don't want to complain all the time. I just don't feel like I have much good or positive to talk about. Thank you so much for all you do. You have such a bright light. Uh, you bring such light to this community. Nothing to complain about with you. <laughs> Too cute. Um, I don't ever tell clients to just stop complaining. I will tell clients to reframe situations and circumstances that are not as negative as they're viewing them. Hence, you know, people who have, well, not hence, it's more like people who have depression tend to see things a little bit more negatively. Or those of us with borderline personality disorders tend to th think things are more than they are. Um, and so I will challenge those uh, perceptions or assumptions or anything. But it's not really about the complaining. Everybody needs to complain sometimes. We all have to talk about all the shit that's going on. I don't come to my therapist and talk about how lovely things are. Sometimes I'll go to her and be like, Oh, that homework was really hard, but it worked or hated the homework, didn't do it. Or, hey, you know, I did that thing you asked and that was great. Uh, those are about like, you know, that's as positive as it's going to get. And that's not even that positive. Usually I'm like, I did that thing again that you told me not to do. I ap over apologized. I'm frustrated and blah, blah, blah. And I just like cry and I vent and I like verbal diarrhea, everything I'm thinking. And that's totally okay and totally normal. That's why I talk about, um, I had this video a while ago, like what's my therapist really saying where I like decode the phrases we use, but that's what I mean by the holding environment. You're supposed to be able to like dump all your shit in there and I can like make space for it and hold it for you and validate it. And so it's a completely okay to, I would even change the phrasing. I would challenge that word complaining. It is perfectly okay for you to express how you feel and the upset that you are experiencing because of the circumstances in your life. That's perfectly normal. Um, however, the one caveat to this, and this is actually something that um, even in my Facebook group, I have a Facebook group if you didn't know, if you're looking for some support, I'm not in there, but we have moderators and uh, it's like community run, community driven. Um, but there's one rule with that group is that you cannot come into the group and just talk about how bad everything is and if people offer you some insight or a tool or, hey, did you try this or think about doing that? You can't be like, nope, that's not going to work. Nope, 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 nope. I want to feel like shit and I'm just going to shit all over this. It's just like you're a black hole for everyone else's potential positivity or just the attempt to be kind of positive or to be at least have some hope. Somebody in the comments of my toxic positivity video, I loved this, said, 
there's a difference between being optimistic and being positive. I prefer to be optimistic, meaning there's a hope for the future. That doesn't negate that I feel like shit now. That just means that uh, that it could, I, I believe it will get better. Positivity is like, oh, how you feel now is the only positive, positive vibes only that everybody hates. And I really loved that distinction. Um, so I think in the same way, it's like you don't have to have like, only good things talk about in therapy because then a you probably wouldn't need therapy but also the second thing is just like we don't we just as long as we're kind of optimistic as long as we have hope um that things can get better I think that that's really good and that I don't know I don't know if I think I feel like I'm talking in circles with this one but complaining is fine but it's not complaining I would encourage you to reframe that and rephrase that um and if things aren't positive that's why you're in therapy we're totally used to this it's totally fine um, he probably doesn't think anything at all. I'm just being honest. I, I mean, I don't know. That's what therapy's for is <laughs> just to complain and vent. But again, what is it? It's not complaining. It is the freedom to express how you feel because of the circumstances that are happening to you or that you're in, I guess. Not even it's happening to you. That sounds very victim-y. It's more like it's part of just what's going on. Um, yeah, but anyway, and I don't know if I fully explain the thing about like uh, the Facebook group and the rules, but it's just like if we aren't open to the possibility that things even could maybe potentially get better in the future or even hopeful about, you know, then I'd be concerned about depression, suicidal thoughts. There's a lot that comes along with that. But really, I just want you to know that it's completely OK to complain. Um, it's completely OK to feel the way you feel and express that in therapy. That's what therapy's there for. OK. Question number 10, because I feel like I could go off the rails on that one, and I kind of already did. And this says, hi, Katie, is it normal to feel some sort of obsession with your therapist? I want to talk to her more often. I want to know more about her, and I really, really miss her right now as she is on holiday. Sometimes I even feel like I love her, though not in a romantic way. I hate myself for feeling this way because it feels so unethical, and the thought that I can't talk to her as much as I'd like drives me insane. Do you think that what I'm feeling is wrong or that I've crossed any boundaries? Should I just ignore these feelings or do you think there's more to it? I love this question. Super common. You're not going crazy and you haven't crossed any boundaries because you haven't, haven't done anything yet. And even if you did, it'd be up to your therapist to tell you like, okay, you can't call me in between sessions other than to reschedule or whatever. That's when they put the boundaries in place and express them to you, communicate that to you. That's how therapy works. You don't have to worry about that. Um, but What's happening is some transference and someone left a comment on this that was exactly what I was going to say, but I want to talk about this because it got a lot of thumbs ups, um, is that tra I have videos about transference and I have videos about having a crush on your therapist, even though you're saying it's not in a romantic way. If some of you out there are listening to this and like, yes, but I do like my therapist in a romantic way. I have a video about that as well. Excuse me. I burped. Um, and so I really think that, uh, it's transference. And my guess would be that there's something in your background with like attachment, maybe not feeling like the women in your life, because this is a female. So it's usually it's usually based around that roughly. Um, never had maybe a an older person or a caretaker in your life for that matter, but probably a female that was really loving, caring, listened to you, supported you, offered sage sage advice. You probably never got that. And so that's why this person it's like you're attaching to them. And so I have a video called, um, I'm attached to my therapist. And then I have one about transference. I would watch both of those. Cause that's kind of what I'm getting at is that it's very normal, but it's usually stemming from some childhood experience. It, having a crush on a therapist doesn't always come from childhood. It sometimes does, but sometimes it could just be like, uh, not understanding love in a regular, in like a romantic versus platonic way and getting those two confused, um, or confusing you know, uh, support and understanding and compassion with romantic love, which is a little different because it's therapy. So anyway, but I have a whole video about that. But for the sake of this one, this particular question, I really believe that it's more to do with attachment in childhood and not feeling like you have someone that's that's helpful, that's loving and supportive and caring of you. And so you found that person and you're like, I want to talk to them all the time. I want to live with them. I want them to take care of me. This is wonderful. And that's all normal. And so what I would encourage you to do is to talk to your therapist about it because there's so much more to it. And it's okay to tell your therapist about how you're feeling. If they're worth it at all, if they're good at their job at all, they're going to be, we hear this all the time. 
Um, I even had a patient that I, uh, over the years, I had many patients like this, but I've had patient, a uh, patient recently who had referred out to a higher level of care and ended up wanting to stay with that therapist, but also wanted to see me because they liked that therapist they met in the treatment center. It was all sorts of complicated, but it was all of this attachment from her childhood and not feeling like anybody ever cared about her. And now she was like, oh, I can have two. And I want, and we had to like, I had to tell her that, no, that, you know, that does, we don't have different specialties. This isn't going to be any different. Anyway, I just want you to know it's very normal and it's okay to bring it up. It's okay to talk about. Uh, every therapist is going to uh, help tease out where it's coming from because that's what I talk to my patient about a lot. Um, you know, but her desire to like go into debt also because it was like hard for her to afford it to go into debt to see all of these therapists. Um, she also was seeing another a dietitian, so it was like all sorts of complicated, you guys, and so expensive. Um, you know, we we have to be able to tease it out, talk about it, and figure out uh, where it's coming from so we can heal. And so the the fact that you have this connection with the therapist is really helpful information, right? It's always just more information for us. Um, yeah, and I just I think that there'll be a lot that comes out of this that will be really good. And so bring it up, talk about it, you'll figure it all out. Um, and I don't, I hope that me sharing that random example, it's not even that good of an example, makes you think your therapist is going to leave you. That's not what I mean. In this particular case, they were, they were doing great work with that other therapist. And because they'd been seeing them and they didn't want to stop seeing them, I kind of gave them the option of seeing me or them and they chose. I don't think that I was like, oh, you can't come back. That's not how that happened. But I was just sharing that like there was a lot of transference and a lot of attachment issues. And that was what fed her uh, desire to see us all, you know, and I understand that, but we, you have to be able to talk it out. And I think your therapist will do a great job on that with you. Okay. Final question. Question number 11. Would a therapist ever ask to see their client's journal and why? Um, I don't know if I've ever asked. I will have patients journal or keep notes about something like track. Uh, for instance, a lot of my patients who have bipolar disorder or anxiety disorders, uh, depression, any kind of symptomology that I'm trying to track, I'll have them track their, um, you know, their mood and their sleep or uh, other things that I'm having them like pay attention to over the course of the week. And then I'll ask if I can see it. But that's part of their homework. So I do ask to see homework. Um, I don't personally ask to see clients' journals that often. The only times that I can even think about that I have is when I know they're having a tough time opening up and they've told me they journal a lot. And so I was like, hey, would you be comfortable bringing it in so that I could take a look at it? And you can just pick, tell me the pages that you want me to read and I'll only read those pages. Um, so something like that I sometimes do. And usually I just make a copy of a couple of those pages because I don't want them to be without their uh, journal. Um, but I don't really ask to see it if it's not already something that's discussed. I really want the journal to be a safe space where they don't feel like I'm like a parent going to come in and like read their diary, you know, without their permission. I feel like it could be if I if I pushed for something like that, I feel like in some ways it could be uh, felt as a invasion of privacy. And I don't want it to feel that way. So it's more of a conversation. And, and I utilize journaling and homework in that aspect, you know, so that I have ways to look at things and to reference and have them track um, or to help them express things they aren't able to do in session. Like I use it as a tool, not as something that I would constantly want to see or, or request to see. But if they told me that they had something in there that they thought could be helpful, then I'd say, hey, would you mind if I read it? It'd always be up to the patient. I would never say like, I want to read that or or try to push the issue. I would ask if they're comfortable. If they're not, I would let off. I would never, you know, I wouldn't push anymore. Um, yeah, but keep journaling. And if you are worried that your patient or your therapist is going to keep asking to see your journal, you can keep your regular journal and then keep your homework in another one. I always have my patients do that anyway, just because then they can leave the homework with me sometimes if I want to, you know, if I have to look at it or if it's part of something that I then have to do stuff with, you know, it depends on what we're working on together. Um, but yeah, that's that journaling is helpful. Do it. it also can help you see progress later, which I will have my patients when we're like, they're graduating from therapy for a while. Um, if they're doing like a, not all people, I have so many patients that will just be like, I don't think I'm going to come in anymore. And they'll like call. I'm like, Oh, do you want a, like a wrap up session? They're like, no, I'm good. But some of my patients who are more attached or 
need a little bit more of like a ending session. We'll have an ending session. I'll tell them to bring their journal so we can go back to when they first started seeing me. I'll read my notes, some of my notes from that session, and I'll have them read from their journal and we'll see how far they've come. And that can be really nice too. Um, but yeah, I think those are just the ways that I utilize journaling. I hope you guys found this uh, helpful. I love your questions. They're so great. Keep them coming. Um, if you're wondering where to ask your questions, because I forgot to tell you at the beginning of this episode, you can ask them on the community tab of the Opinions That Don't Matter YouTube channel. That is where Sean and I keep all of our podcasts, uh, really all being two. The one that I do with Sean called Opinions That Don't Matter. And then this one, Ask Katie Anything. Um, yeah, and share. Share the podcasts. These podcasts are usually not monetizable because... Um, you know, because of the way that YouTube has their regulations around uh, what I can talk about and mental health is uh, so, as they say, uh, what's the word they use? It's nuanced. Such a fucking annoying word. Anyway, all the content is so nuanced. It's hard to tell if it's good or bad. And I'm like, it's educational. Come on now. Um, so yeah, so uh, share because that's how I can get sponsors for the podcast. It can help, uh, you know, help us afford new equipment and a new space to do it in. Um, anyway, thank you so, so much for listening. Leave your reviews on Apple Podcasts or wherever podcasts you can leave reviews. I listen on Apple, so I don't know the others, but um, leave those reviews. That's really helpful as well. Thank you so much Ask for listening. Ask her about Have a your self-esteem or why your feelings hurt. You can ask her why breakups suck or why you've hit a plateau. Inquire all those questions you